So you just throw eighty five percent of it wasn't covered. You don't need um, to break them in or I that's when I covering is breaking them in. If I've got if I've been able to run the breakthrough there, that's when I feel like I've done a good job. Okay. Yeah. Because I've tried that before and I like the break kind of brings a clump of seeds into one spot and yeah. so it's like it's hard. I haven't gotten the technique right so I can Anybody's break. welcome to come down to my pad and open it for a little while. I'd love to some tricks. I'd yeah. love to. Yeah. yeah please. <clears throat> totally welcome. I'm not that far away. Less than three hours from here. Um, Okay. Yeah, it's, um, <clears throat> anyway, tangents, but germination, who was this? Germination, yes. Um, the spinach and beets, those guys have big seeds that are oftentimes need um, more moisture in the soil to actually go through the process of germination. Um, and if you've got light soil, I would say probably you don't have enough water when you're, when you're germinating. Um, one good trick for do that process is, to, especially with big seeds, is to just literally put them in a bowl of water for 12 hours before you plant. Um, you could put a little bit of kelp in there, a little bit of seawater in there, it'd be much better. Um, pour the water out through a strainer, let them dry for half an hour so they're not sticking together, um, and then they're already basically soaked. Um, but I'm really anal about keeping my soil moist between planting and germination. Right. If I have to be out there with a the hose spraying them three times a day, so be it. It is absolutely critical that you maintain moisture for every moment between planting and germination. Do you do that um, with a hose or do you have sprinklers? I have a hose with a little on off switch that is half off. And I walk down the bed down and I got two beds here and two beds there. Okay. Um, and, I, and, I, and I run drip tape. So I put the drip tape down as soon as I plant. Mm -hmm. I plant, rake, Put the chip tape down, turn it on, come through the hose, get it nice and soaked, yeah. and then as I need to on and off with the drip tape, I'll turn it on and off to keep it moist. But if I have to go back with the hose to get dry spots, absolutely anal about getting dry spots, right? Because I'm trying to germinate the whole the whole bed. But it's really really critical. That's one of the best tricks in the book for spinach and beets. Um, you know, they if they don't have enough moisture, they're not going to germinate. The the balance I worry about is because it is well drained. Like if I if I have the irrigation and I use drip irrigation if I yeah. have that going, um, try to balance not losing too much nutrients by watering like watering a good amount. There's a problem with soluble nutrients because yeah. they leach out. Mm -hmm. So if you have if you don't have soluble nutrients and you're feeding them with some small amount, I will talk about mixing them with humates and sugars. You can use molasses. You can use um, straight sugar. Uh, humates, biochar are all things you can mix with anything that you think is soluble or might be soluble. But um, it is a concern. But if you don't have water, it games off. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, as far as primary is concerned. Okay, air and water. What else does soil life need to exist to flourish? Heat. Temperature actually is very important. I'll write it down, even though I don't need to talk about it here in Vermont. We <laughs> <laughs> said the importance of it. Temperature and the value of poop houses. Um, I'm going to talk more about temperature tomorrow in the morning. For germination and seedlings and things like that. Um, what else? Mm -hmm. Soluble minerals. What's that? Soluble minerals. It needs nutrients. It needs it needs those elements to be present. It needs a certain level of copper and zinc and calcium and potassium. So minerals. Yep. To build their bodies with, for their biochemistry to function, for their enzymes to be there, to build carbohydrates out of sugars and things. The soil life needs a spectrum of elements. What else do they need? <clears throat> light? What's that? Light? Light. Uh, well, the plants use light more than the soil life does. What does the soil life need to function? Um, and what does the plant do that light? Organic matter. It makes sugar or organic matter. It makes carbon. Various forms of carbon are critical to soil life. Oops. If you don't have something green growing, feeding the soil life, then you damn well better have something brown that they can digest to feed them. Otherwise, they're going to starve to death, which is what happens in the winter on bare soil, or in the summer on bare soil. There's nothing to feed the soil life, so they die. You no longer have the Grand Banks. You have a dead zone. The vast majority of life in the soil resides in direct relation to plant, plant roots, and the rest of them are in relationship to organic matter. So if you've got bare soil with nothing growing, what you have is starvation, and you have, I like to call it genocide, because that is a word that gets through people. 
right? You are responsible for the death of billions or trillions or quadrillions, depending on the amount of space of organisms, because of how you manage the soil. Right? It's not about necessarily perfection, it's about minimizing destruction. Right? If you can just minimize the things that you do that are destructive, life will take it from there. She's really good. All right, one last piece. The species themselves. Life itself. Yes, biology. In many cases, we don't actually have the species of life present in the environment that we want to have present. They never got their colostrum. They've never had sauerkraut. They came from, you know, uh, crack baby, uh, they were crack babies from a uh, seed packet. Right? Um, so, inoculation, establishing that gut flora overtly. These are the foundational principles. I don't usually have temperature in there. Sunlight is another one that you can put in or take out. Um, also very important. Um, so, you know, I love to talk about frequency and, you know, vibrations and vortexes and magnets and all that kind of stuff, which is really, really exciting and it's totally powerful. But if you don't get these things taken care of first, my experience is you're missing the boat. You're missing the boat. This is a critique I have of the biodynamic community. They're it's really, fun. really sophisticated um, when all the subtleties and they don't ever take so much to deal with boron. Um, you don't have boron, you don't have silicon, you don't have silicon, you don't have calcium, you don't have calcium. <laughs> Game's pretty much off. Boron is an anion, boron leaches. Anybody who's not taking the soil test and is not going to get around to taking the soil test, get some borax and spread it out there. Right? It's real simple. Get some borax, 30 pounds to the acre. If you're not going to take a soil test, if you're not going to follow through with everything else, 30 pounds of borax to the acre will be massive. And a little bit of gypsum would be great. <clears throat> what about cycles in the environment? What kind of cycles? Any cycles. Like the environment that the soil is existing in is not um, consistent. It's always changing. Sure. So, and there's predictable cycles. Would those be... Spring, summer, and fall? <clears throat> yeah. Like... <clears throat> even like just like in the day, it becomes more dry and at the night the dew settles. Um, obviously, yeah. you can have healthy soil indoors and not. But even indoors, there's, there's a cycling of nutrients. So would, would that be a, uh, necessary? I'm not sure what your question is. Of, of that list you just made. Um, if you don't have these basic things present, Right, but I'm these saying, guys are going to be dead, it, and the plant's not going to be able to function. Right, and is is like up point. of the nutrients and environment also necessary? When you have life in the soil, the cycling it oh. uh, it is it's a it's a living organism. It takes care of itself. It's it's a it's a you know a free energy machine. It's you know it's a it's it's a motor that feeds itself and kicks out extra energy. It's it's um, very intelligent and. Um, I think actually it violates basic laws of chemistry. It does, you know, transmutation and all kinds of really, really interesting stuff. Um, yeah, there's a couple cycles that are, you know, we can talk about. Um, the tidal force. The, um, people know about the tides going up and down in the ocean. Um, as I understand it, the moon is what's causing the water to come down. It's the gravity of the moon, and that doesn't just happen on the ocean. It happens on land also that the moon is there making the water go up and down. So if you don't have a plow pan, but you have a decent water table, then the water moves up and down twice a day to feed your plant roots, um, which is a really, really valuable um, asset. And I think it's how plants in nature are able to maintain, you know, in the midst of a drought. In many cases, they have deeper root systems, so it's not such an issue. This is why you know, maintaining hydration and all the permaculture conversations about water catchment and key line, you know, ponds and all that kind of stuff is really, really um, valuable, I think. You can, in a passive manner, organize your landscape so that the, the moisture is maintained throughout the, throughout the year without any need for any mechanized systems. Uh, for pastures, for orchards, for places where you're not going to be doing irrigation, um, thinking about that, taking advantage of that is really valuable. Is the moon why moisture comes out of the ground in the evening after the sun sets? Is that the movement of moisture in the soil? It's not always the same time of day that it gets moist and it gets dry. I, there's all these subtle forces that are going on. 
But you can, but you can totally see it. You can see oh, you do. the water was like it's dry, and then it was moist, and then it was dry, and it was like. <laughs> but that's what makes me wonder about watering the garden when it's dry, because yeah. it seems that the moisture is there and it's just waiting for the. It depends on the lay of your land. Yeah. It depends on the the underlying geology. It depends on the you know historical um, compaction mm -hmm. logistics. It depends on whether you got a clay with water uphill or you're on the top of a sand dune. Um, in some places, I mean, I'm not sure what your soil is like, but some places where you've got a light, a light sandy soil, um, at least where I am, um, this summer, there was no water coming up because the water table was down so far. Um, it wasn't working. So in some places it'll work, it, but the more you work with your land, the more you build your organic matter and things like that, um, the more resilience you have. Absolutely. Categorically. Yeah. And, uh, I grew up on a, in a farm where we grew tomatoes indoors. For yeah. years and years, you could see how the tomatoes would ripen uh, when the moon would be full yeah. or new. And mm -hmm. when the moon was kind of extreme phases, yeah. tomatoes would really kind of ripen much faster. In, yeah. in that period. This is one of the pieces the biodynamic community is bringing forth more right. than anybody else is the attention to the subtle forces, which are not so subtle <laughs> once you start noticing. Everybody in the hot sunny day in August, like 90 degrees, no clouds. And one day is just so muggy, you're just dripping in sweat. And the next day, you've got a sunstroke. Everybody had that experience? Mm -hmm. That was when the moon went from Cancer to Leo. Cancer is a water sign. On a water sign day, when it's hot and beating down sun, it'll, it'll, you'll feel so wet and muggy and just like sweaty, sticky. And the next day, when it goes into Leo, all of a sudden, it's that harsh, dry, piercing, like sunstroke kind of. It's the same temperature. You can look at the thermometer, it's the same temperature, but the energy of the day is totally different. There are so many subtleties that are out there. You know, which days do you make kimchi? When do you pick your root crops? Um, it gets very exciting. Um, <laughs> we just have to pay attention to these things. Yeah, there's a lot going on there. Totally. Um, but if you don't have silica in the cell walls to begin with, all your winter squash is going to rot, regardless of when you pick it. Right, you have to get, the plant has to be functioning at a basic level to have these subtler forces really show their true metal. Um, so that's my one, I'm not sure why I'm emphasizing that point, but I was much more in the metaphysical bent 10 years ago. And the more I farmed, the more I realized, you know, <laughs> get off your philosophical high horse and <laughs> take care of the basics. Um, you know, if you don't take care of the basics, you're not, you know, the whole system is, you aren't going to get to that level where these things are really most, um, you know, evident. Okay, so this is the basic introductory, you know, statements here. I think I have a few uh, slides talking about um, quality being the objective. I, I discussed that in, in short at the beginning. Um, quality being nutrition, being flavor, being aroma, being uh, shelf life, being pest and disease resistance. Um, um, I think for me that is the objective and um, I think you know there are some organic farmers who are doing a really good job of quality and some are doing a really crappy job and you can apply that same distinction to every other form of farming whether it be local or permaculture or you know um, natural farming or whatever whatever your whatever your type type is some people are doing a good job of quality some people aren't um, but quality for me is really the objective um, I think it there's a really nice correlation between the life, the vitality in the soil, the, and the vitality of the plant, and the vitality of the animal that eats the plant, and if that animal is us, then the vitality of our culture and our net effect on the environment. So that was the point I was making earlier about the larger, you know, systemic effects. I think when we do grow good crops and begin to eat them more broadly, um, we can expect a more holistic, systemic um, shift in our culture. So that excites me. Um, the bottom slide on page one is basically the topics that we're formally going to be going over in the handout. And I think I've covered page one. Anything else on there? I just want to just reiterate. So if you're too late to put a cover crop and just throw leaves down. Yes. And you're saying what, four inches of leaves? A bunch. A bunch. Ever yeah. made soup? Yeah. A little of this, a little How much when you feel like that's right. not right? All right. Anybody know that sense? A few of you know that sense? That's the real important one. <laughs> I'm going to talk about numbers and you know math and algebra and multiplication. 
but it comes down to that like sense of, eh, I'm, not, I'm just gonna, that's enough for now. Or I think I really want to do some more. Anybody been on the field and like, you thought you were gonna go do this and all of a sudden you end up doing that because if that's what needs to be done, it's that rudimentary level of common sense and intuition which is foundational. And you and respect it and you honor it and And then the spring it. you just till it in, right? Um, depending leaves. on what you're talking about, um, you, I would suggest tillage is not necessary. The whole point of putting leaves down is so that the soil is loose. And if you're going to be transplanting in a seedling, um, just the water. you just make a hole okay. in the leaves and put the seedling in. And you have no weeds and no tillage and nice mulch. Okay. And you've done almost no work. Right. You ever put drip tape down in the fall under the mulch so it's there waiting for you? Or um, you I don't get around to taking out the drip tape in the fall. And then sometimes it's a little bit clogged and I don't bother taking it out and putting new drip tape down. I just come down with a little nail and poke new holes in it. <laughs> oh, you're funny. <laughs> well, it works. <laughs> it's real simple. Um, I have a very passive drip tape system. People don't know what drip tape is. Everybody here pretty much has an idea what drip tape is. So drip tape, you know, a thousand, no, sorry, a mile and a half of drip tape is 140 bucks or something, plus or minus, right? Um, you can get a lot of drip tape for not much money. Uh, I have three lines of drip tape in every four foot bed. Four foot bed, one, two, three lines of drip tape. Max a foot between them. I have a passive system where I, I there's a couple of spots that are wet. I don't have land that's quite as hilly as this, but it's pretty hilly. And so the spots that are wet in between the, you know, the high points. So I've dug holes there, and now they're ponds. And I have an electric line running out from the house to the pond with a sump pump attached to it. And I pump the water from the sump pump to a syrup tank. Those, you know, those cubes, syrup, you know, on a pallet size. Mm -hmm. And that's at the high point of the garden. And that's got an on-off spigot. And that goes to the drip tape. Sump pump is the only technology, power, pressure in the whole system. Um, and I can maintain hydration through a drought. So it's gravity fed from it's the gravity drip. fed from the drip tank. <clears throat> right. And that's enough pressure to go through the drip, drip tape. People who are like engineers debate me on this one. <laughs> and I like tell them like water runs downhill every single day of the week. <laughs> Every single day of the week, water runs downhill. So as long as you put the tank at the highest spot in the field, and if you want to push it, you take two or three pallets, right. and you put the tank on top of the pallets. So you don't need to build a pressure. tower to get enough head pressure, <laughs> PSI. Okay. I don't know what the PSI is in my system. It's not very high, but it works. It totally works. Really low tech, really simple, and yeah, I don't usually pick up the drip tape. I mean. I picked up none of the drip tape so far. <laughs> we'll see if do I you, Do you have problems well. with, uh, well, it sounds like you don't. I have some problems with, uh, like, voles or something yes. chewing the tape. And eating my root crops. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> More importantly, <laughs> thousands of dollars of carrots so and beets and potatoes were, like, not around last fall. <laughs> they were all hollow. Um, I have been um, actively increasing my cat population. Um, I was very supportive of my six-year-old getting two kittens, <laughs> female, <laughs> last year. It was, it was actually his sixth six birthday. And they became, you know, cats by the winter and they had kittens by the spring and now we've got about six cats and I had almost zero oh, wow. um, rodent pressure. I don't feed them, right? They live outside. I mean, I start to feed them in the winter time. But they don't get fed and they don't come in the house. And they've got a job to do, which is to eat rodents. Um, and uh, it's had a dramatically positive effect. We um, have had real serious rodent issues. Um, you know, I grew up with 